Welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. This is the latest one we've ever done in East Coast time anyway. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so happy to be here today. We're going to be talking all about uh, tracking sharks uh, and all the work that Juliana does. Um, what other things do you need to know? On Friday, we're having another live stream all about cleaning up toxic areas and how you can best do that. Um, and then uh, next week, we've got three more live streams. Uh, this is a little bit of a light week, um, just because that's how things shook out. And so we'll have more later. Um, so I think that's about all I have to say. The other thing is that if you can support our program, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. So if you can, that would be super awesome. And you can do that via patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or paypal.me slash Skype a scientist. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Juliana. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Super excited to be here today, hanging out with everybody. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a PhD student here in Sydney at the Fish Lab at Macquarie University. And uh, I've studied everything to do with this, this Port Jackson shark. That's my life. That's what I think about and what I go after on a daily basis. And um, my lab is really cool because it, it studies all the possible questions about this shark. So it's uh, everything to do with like metabolic rates, cognition, learning, movement, behavior, like all of the above. So any questions you guys have about that stuff are welcome too, because there's so many facts we know now about the shark. Still a lot we don't know, but you know, a decent amount we've, we've accrued over the years. So um, I, I wanted to tell you guys first the, the story of this PJ shark, Port Jackson shark is how we call them. And, um, and you know, PJ shark, team PJ for, for short. And what we do is, um, is that this shark was, was actually known as like a super, super lazy shark. That's what the public thought of it. It doesn't need to swim to breathe like a lot of other sharks. So it can actually just lay on the bottom of the ocean and pump water over its gills. So it's like a buccal pumping, like a cheek pumping method that it uses. And yeah, you know, I, well, a bird. And I can um, and I can totally see why people saw this as a as a super lazy shark because you go out there you know in the harbors and bays and you're seeing it like resting there and during the daytime when you're snorkeling and diving that's all you see is like these sharks basically piled on top of one one another resting together and and doing that all day long and um, and what happens is that they come into Sydney's harbors and bays and Jervis Bay and all of these coastal areas along the east coast of Australia and it's super weird because they only do that during the winter time each year and and everyone was like all right where where are these sharks going what are they doing how come they're only here at this certain time of the year what's going on with that so what happened was that they put uh, a few tags out on some of these sharks and they were like, where's the shark gonna end up like later on? And then that, those tagged sharks, a couple of them were spotted near Tasmania, like super far south. And this led to the hypothesis that this shark is actually doing really long migrations. So then a team of people got together, which is the lab I'm now a part of, and, um, and they started this long-term tagging study where they actually implanted acoustic tags inside the body cavity of the sharks and, um, and then like watch them, watch them show up in different places, saw what they were doing. And they confirmed that yes, this small shark that's about four feet long is doing these super long, impressive migrations of like about a thousand kilometers. So it's like from, I don't know, like North Carolina to Florida. So like really, really impressive. And, um, and then we, that led to a whole like spew of other questions, basically like, okay, so like how fast are they doing this? Like maybe they're using the East Australian current to get down there, like what's happening and what are they doing inside of the harbors and bays when they're actually in there? So, you know, I'm sure you guys can imagine that studying animals in the ocean is super difficult. It's really, really hard. Cause you, you know, I can't hold my breath for very long and you know, all that stuff. And, uh, and it's, it's a watery world in there. So, you know, you go out to do your day job and all you see is like the big wide open ocean and you're wondering how you're supposed to study your, your study species. 
And um, marine biologists are super lucky, and I feel really lucky to be one right now because there's all this really cool technology out there that we can use. And this is like tagging technology, basically. And one of the coolest things is the accelerometer tag. And this, this is called an accelerometer, but it's basically the same sensor that's inside of your smartphones or inside of your Fitbits. And it's just like counting steps, tracking movement, basically. And, you know, obviously in like salt ocean water, um, you have to like seal things up really well. So it's like covered in epoxy, like plastic and, and stuff like that to make it waterproof and resistant to all these things. But it has that sensor inside of it. And it also has a depth and a temperature sensor. And it can have tons of other sensors in there too, like cameras or magnetometer, which measures the magnetic field of the earth or a gyroscope, which has like even more a three dimensional kind of measurement to it. And it can measure pH and other environmental factors too that are changing the movement of the shark that it's on. And so we, we get to put those on the sharks and see what they're doing. And, and how we do that is just by going out into Sydney Harbor, going and like catching some sharks and, um, and, then, and bringing them into Taronga Zoo in Sydney. And then we put the tag on the sharks. Uh, there's a few different attachment methods. One of them is like a direct dorsal fin attachment method. And then I also designed this like little harness that we can put around the sharks and have them wear it that way, which is like a little shark wetsuit, you know. Um, and that was really good because it's like less invasive. So these sharks are sensitive, you know, like it's, uh, they've never felt gravity before, you know, how would you feel if you just came up and then all of a sudden you're feeling like all this pressure and weight and their organs are different than ours. So it's actually quite heavy for them. And we put the, the, the tags on for just a number of days. And, um, and then we, we take video of the sharks with high definition video footage, basically collecting all that. And then we match the accelerometer data, the movement data to the, uh, to the actual footage. And so we can get a picture of each of those behaviors. So um, this is really important because we were able to get things like feeding behavior, which, uh, which kind of looked like, uh, like chewing. So every time the shark chewed, we got that signature. And I can show you guys a little bit actually here about what that looks like. So this is my PJ shark right here. This is what they look like. And you can see they look a little bit different. Oh, this one's tagged, yep. And, and so it's the same sensor as what's in your cell phone. So this is just measuring the acceleration. And this is what it looks like when the shark is resting, right? Little to no movement. But when the shark starts to swim from side to side, oh, wake up, then, then it looks a little bit different there. You see some spikes. And when the shark is, is really like burst swimming, swimming really fast, it looks different again. And if the shark is chewing on some prey, like urchins or little mollusks or something like that, it looks different again. And then of course the shark turns upside down when it's mating. So, you know, that looks real, real different. There it is. So you can see how we, we make those pictures of the behaviors of what the shark is doing. And, um, and I really wanted to focus in on this, this chewing behavior, which is a proxy for feeding basically. And, um, and so we collected all that data and all that footage, and then we put the tags on wild sharks. So we went out into the harbor again, and we tagged sharks. And then 10 days later, I go back to collect those tags, and I have to find the shark again underwater. And it's really hard, and sometimes I have no idea where they are. And sometimes we lose them, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. And, and these tags are expensive, so I'll just, you know, note that there. And, um, and then, what we do is we get the tags back, we download that data, and then I can see how many times the shark fed, uh, about where it was, what temperature, what depth it was at, and, and things like that. And what we, what we think now is that these sharks are actually really important for the rocky reef ecosystems because they mostly feed on urchins um, and, and some other teleos fish, like bony fish and stuff. So um, they're actually regulating the, the ecosystems that they're in. So if something were to change their seasonal migrations or their movements, then the whole rocky reef ecosystem would change and possibly collapse. So we know that these sharks are, are you know, key little guys in, in what's happening in those systems. And, um, and it's, it's inter interesting because a lot of people are, are saying that 
oh, uh, you know, why do you study this shark? They're not vulnerable, they're not threatened. And in fact, that's probably the reason why we, why we study them is because there are so many of them. By the tens of thousands, they're inside of those harbors and bays. So, uh, so we really wanna know what they're up to and, and see exactly what, what kind of effects they're having on the ecosystems. So I hope, you know, I've showed you guys a little bit. I have all these like fun toys and stuff around me that I can show you um, a little bit more about the PJ shark. But if you guys want to ask uh, any questions, you know, feel free to, uh, to ask about this very cool shark. Awesome. So we got a whole bunch of questions here already. Um, oh. Let's see. Uh, the first question is, uh, how does putting the tag on the shark affect the shark's life? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's a lot of rules around how heavy and how big a tag can be, and it shouldn't be more than 1% of the animal's body weight. And this is because obviously we want the animals we tag behaving in a really natural way, in a normal way. Otherwise the tagging data we gather to help manage these marine ecosystems is gonna be useless. So uh, I only leave the tags on for a short amount of time uh, in these studies. And we do that so that, uh, so be, partly because the tags can only gather a certain amount of information and they only have a certain amount of battery life, but also because we don't want the sharks affected too much. And there is really cool research on how the external tagging of fish can, um, can actually cause other fish to behave differently around them and affect their social networks and stuff like that. So, yeah. That's cool. Um, so how do you catch these sharks? Oh, very good question. So this is, they're, you know, they're resting on the bottom. Like I said, they're, they're pretty kind of uh, lazy looking, but actually that was disproven because they're just nocturnal. From all these tagging studies we found out, they're not lazy at all, they're just nocturnal, so they get really active at nighttime. So we catch them during the day. So they're right there resting and we basically just put our hand over the, the pectoral fin or we lightly touch the tail here and then we just tuck the shark uh, under our arm like this. And, um, and many of them like don't struggle at all and some of them may struggle a lot. And that's actually a personality study we did with the sharks too, is we caught them over and over again and checked how they react to catching. And, um, and the bold sharks will like respond like this every time and the shy sharks will just kind of freeze like that. And, um, <laughs> and then we slowly, slowly bring them up to the boat. And actually this is where I'd like to share my screen with you guys so you could see a short video of this. So I'll give Aaron a couple seconds to sign that. So and, just, um, um, if you need Aaron, check the, the, like, speak, the view up at the top. You're gonna have two rectangles on top of one another. Once uh, we switch to screen share, click that and you'll see Aaron. Okay. Hmm. It says host disabled oh. attendee screen share. I'll uh, make you a co-host, one sec. Okay. Now it should work. Okay. Great. Sharing. Okay, so this should be the video, right? Okay. Right here of how we actually catch the shark underwater. Oops. Okay. Coming up on the resting shark. Oh, and some. just tucking it under your arm like that. <laughs> and there's my dive buddy across from me also catching a shark and then bringing it up really slowly. All right, that's it. That seems so much easier <laughs> than it should be. <laughs> <laughs> it, it kind of is, I think. It really is. And, but if they don't want to be caught, they won't be caught. Like, there's no way that I can, I can get my hands on a shark that, that doesn't want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone asks, and I was wondering this too, have you ever been bitten by one? It's a good question. Um, in the many years, I think like six years or something now, I've been working with these sharks. Uh, I've been bitten once and it was completely my fault. So 
they are they're not aggressive at all and um, you know many sharks obviously aren't aggressive and uh, right here I think it's important to note that shark bites and shark attacks are extremely rare so there's all kinds of cool statistics out there like you're more likely to die from a vending machine falling on you or from taking a selfie on a cliff than ever be um, bit by a shark so um, but these sharks, so because we work with them so much, um, one time we, we saw a shark underwater and um, it had an older tag on it from a study that was done a long time ago, an external tag. And um, we were trying to take it off of its tail. And because I basically forgot these sharks can bite, I basically put my arm almost like inside, you know, right in front of it when we were handling it. So of course it just bit down on my arm like right there and these guys are funny because they bite down and they kind of don't let go they can stay on for a good like 20 or 30 minutes so I just waited patiently and luckily it didn't take 20 or 30 minutes it just took a couple of minutes but you know it was that little like little pinch kind of burn sensation I guess and um, it was it was it was fine it was totally fine and went off happy and I also you know ascended happily too <laughs> well, that's good <laughs> yeah <laughs> um cool so what's like the size range of these sharks we could kind of see them in relation to your body but how big how small can they get yeah that's a good one so it's uh basically the males are just under a meter so around oh um so like three three feet or so and uh, the females can get a bit bit bigger four feet or like meter and a half or something like that and the, the females are always, always bigger like that. And they can be like 40 pounds or like, or like, you know, 18 kilo or something like that. And, and the males are a bit lighter and smaller. And, um, and while they're inside of those harbors and bays in Sydney, the females are actually laying two eggs every two weeks. So that's their breeding time right then. And, um, and we can see the, those females, um, when you kind of feel their abdomen, you can feel these like spiral shaped eggs inside of them. And they're, the, these eggs are amazing. Like they're the texture of seaweed and, um, and they're like corkscrew shaped. And there was this myth about them that, you know, the poor Jackson sharks are going and screwing in these eggs into rock crevices and stuff like that. But they are, they're not, um, they actually cannibalize eggs. So like in, in the zoo, if I didn't dive in within an hour, you know, that egg would be gone. So um, yeah, basically they, they're really cool. And after a couple months, um, the mucus plug inside of the eggs like uh, goes away and you can unfold the egg, look inside and there's this perfect little baby shark inside of the egg. And uh, after 10, 12 months, they, they hatch and, um, and they're out there doing their doing their juvenile shark thing so that's adorable um <laughs> so grant is age 10 and he would like to know uh what in your opinion is the cl the cutest shark of them all oh my gosh i am i'm very very biased because i just i just love poor jackson sharks like their faces like everything like their little noses and their like mouths and and all that and it's just it's just too much. And I, you know, you spend so much time with these animals, you can tell their, their faces apart. Like you can actually see how they move differently. And like, they say that about sheep farmers too. Like there's like, you know, hundreds of sheep and he's like, oh, that, that's that sheep. And that's us with our squid and our sharks probably, you know? And, um, <laughs> and then, uh, but I'd have to say the broadnose seven gill shark also has my heart. It is, it is a very, very cool shark, adorable shark. And they have like very unique characteristics as well. They're super amazing. Awesome. Thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, Lydia would like to know how much food can a shark hold? Wow. That's a good question. So, I guess it depends on on like what type of what species of shark it is. Of course, these like really really big guys like tiger sharks and white sharks and bull sharks can hold a lot more food than like a four foot PJ Port Jackson shark. Um, but that's that's one of the things that we're actually really interested in is like the metabolic rates and feeding frequency of these sharks. So 
um, in the past and, and even now, um, they do like stomach content surveys of marine animals. So they open up the stomach and they see exactly what's inside of there, what it's been eating, how much food is in there. Um, but sometimes these things are unreliable because some types of food are soft, like squid, for example, and they digest quicker and they're like, they're gone faster than like the little crunchy things that are, that are in there sometimes. And, um, and so, yeah, we really want to find out exactly what these sharks need, how many times they need to feed a day and how much food they need. So I, I don't know. We've got to find out. Cool. Oh, I love hearing that we don't know because that means there's more science to be done. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so other than um, urchins, what are PJ sharks eating? Okay, so there's... We know also from um, stable isotope studies, which is basically the study of you are what you eat. So you can take blood from a PJ or some skin or muscle tissue from, from a PJ shark and you can analyze that and you can see, okay, it has these chemicals in it and, and this is where the shark was and, and maybe what it was eating. So you can see, is it eating things that are lower in the food chain or higher up in the food chain? And we actually found out that females are eating things that are lower in the food chain. So things like the urchins um, and mollusks and little clams and stuff like that. And the male sharks are actually eating more bony fish and um, the things that are higher up in the food chain. So this, this is really interesting to us and, and makes us think a whole lot of things and have a whole lot of questions. And, um, and yeah, we really want to find out because we know that the male sharks are actually arriving sooner in the harbors and bays to breed. And we think this is because they're kind of like staking out a territory, like they're coming in and staking that out. And then the females arrive like one month later. And then we think the males are like intercepting the females and doing this breeding thing with them. And, um, and then at the end of the breeding season, the, the males actually leave one month sooner than the females. So the females might be staying later to reduce predation on their eggs, is what we think. Awesome. And, and oh, well, that's related to the question in that males might need more energy in some cases. Okay. Cool, awesome. <laughs> so um, how did you get to where you are in your career? Like how did you become a shark scientist? Yes, it is. Well, it's a, it's a quite a story. Like when, when I was in college and, you know, I was really interested in the marine world and in the animal behavior world. And, um, and I, I volunteered, I got out there, I talked to people, I tried to um, network with professors and other people who are in the fields that I wanted to be in. I went over to like, Tufts Veterinary School and I looked at um, mouse behavior studies and I got to know, you know, how do you look at animals? How do you figure out um, how, what their movements mean and what their behaviors mean? And then after college, I, you know, I loved the ocean and I just was drawn to Sydney in general. So I moved back here and I started um, a master's in biodiversity conservation. And that was amazing. I learned so much about the framework of research and why it's important to find out what animals are doing. And, and then after that, I started a master of research in, well, just a master of research where you get a project and you try to figure out as much as you can. But the reason I got the shark project was because I was volunteering in a seal lab and I was doing work with seals and sea lions and a wonderful mentor um, took me under her wing and taught me everything about tagging and accelerometer tags and machine learning because we need to use machine learning tools to analyze the millions of data points that come from these tags. And I was so grateful for that and because it's this amazing tool. So, um, I thought, okay, like sharks really, really need some help. You know, they have a really bad image, bad PR. So if we need to find out more about any animal and change the public's perception of any animal, it's probably sharks. And, in, in, you know, I'm biased, but, you know, there's also other animals that receive less attention. So, um, so yeah, I decided to apply this tagging technology to, to a lab um, also at the university that was working with sharks. But basically, I got to where I am through volunteering and through um, just putting myself out there into random projects and programs like that. Great. Um, I had a pretty similar experience just with squid. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. Um, how big is a PJ shark egg? Oh, okay. So a PJ shark egg is approximately like if you held your hand like this, it's like that big. And um, they, they're kind of consistently that size, but maybe you guys can see oh, this picture. Wow. That's and huge. It's big, right? Yeah. Gosh, look at that size. Oh yeah. My wow. It's big. And, it's a, and you can see the, the baby shark that comes out of it there. So cute. It is. <laughs> oh. oh my God. They're, they're like perfect versions of their adult selves. They're like miniature perfect versions. I love it's when the babies just look like the adults, but tiny. It cracks me up. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. It's like, so funny. Um, awesome. So how long do they live? So we can, we can find out how they live by kind of counting the rings, like in many other species and like in trees, for example. So the rings inside of um, bone or PJs actually have this spine um, right in front of their dorsal fins and in front of the second dorsal fin here. And, um, and if you look at the rings inside of that, you can see, and we, we think around 30 years is what the, what the estimate is. Cool. So are those spines like dogfish spines? Yeah, yeah, are basically. Are they related to dogfish? They are, yes, they're, they're one of those. And the, the sister species is the, the horn sharks. So in California and in Japan as well. So, so they're, they're kind of in that group of the bullhead sharks. Oh, wow, I didn't know, that's awesome. Um, yeah. And what's their range? You said they live on the east coast of Australia and then you find them in uh, uh, Tasmania? Yeah, so all okay. along that, that east coast, so even a little bit north, so not quite in the warm waters, still in the cool waters on the east coast of Australia, all the way down to Tasmania, and then also a population on the west coast over to the side, which makes it a really cool study system to look at with all the separate areas. Because we, we saw that the sharks actually behave quite differently when they're migrating, like out, out of that Sydney and Jervis Bay and Port Stephens population, which are all on the east coast of Australia, we see some of the sharks migrating south, some of them moving north, and some of them just disappear. They just go with maybe off the continental shelf or something like that. So we don't know exactly where all of them are going, but there seem to be differences in their migration strategies. Very cool. Love a good mystery. Um, <laughs> There's when, a lot of them. <laughs> a lot of them, yeah. Uh, the first time that you caught a shark, were you scared? I think I was. Yeah, I think I was a bit scared. I, I was at, uh, I was in Sydney Harbor, actually, and we were catching sharks to bring them into Taronga Zoo. And I was like, okay, this is my big moment. This is my chance. You know, I'd been taught how to do it and, and um, told what to kind of do physically and what to look out for. And um, I started with a female because um, they're not always easier, but um, sometimes the males are a little bit bolder and they tend to move a bit more. So yeah, I went down there, um, you know, I put my hand in front of the pectoral fin and tucked her under my arm and then just came up very, very slowly. And it was a success. I was very happy. Right. Whenever I'm working with animals that are, that are big in particular, it's like I'm equally afraid of me hurting them as I am of them hurting me. I'm like, because if they freak out, like, I'm just always so afraid I'm going to pull their little muscles or something. But Exactly. Yeah. I know. And it's something yeah. we think about always, like, working with these animals. You, yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. So, Brandon would like to know, when you were a kid, uh, did you really like sharks? I think I loved everything in the ocean. I don't think I had a specific fascination with sharks other than the general fascination that I think a lot of people have just like kind of this curiosity and some people even have this like morbid curiosity like if you if you type sharks into Google it's like the top things that come up are like sharks with shark attack shark bite sharks with lasers on their head and like stuff like that so but I, I was never I was never um, afraid of them I think I never worried about that I I think even now, like even as I go on walks like outside now, I'm just always like staring at the water and like waiting to see something cool. That's probably something a lot of marine biologists have in common. 
and um and we just love like watching animals and like seeing seeing how they behave so that's that's what got me like i'd be sitting in math class and looking out the window staring at like a group of bunnies outside so yeah i relate um how deep in the water do pj sharks live in so inside of the coastal harbors and bays um we're looking from like 10 to uh 20 meters so not that deep so like uh, like 40, 50 feet, sometimes they're getting down to that depth um, in the middle of the bays that we're looking at. But sometimes it's, it's really coastal and it's really shallow. So only like, like 20 feet or 15 feet on these like rocky, um, rocky coastal habitats. And um, yeah, so it makes them an easy species to work with and easy to observe. But again, not, not so easy that we can answer these questions without tagging them and actually tracking them for 24 hours a day for 10 days. Very cool. Um, do PJ sharks have any unique features? They are unique features. So those spines that we talked about, those are pretty cool in front of the dorsal fins. And their, their eyes are really cool as well. Um, okay, so first of all, the spines, we think they're, they're kind of like this, uh, one theory is that they're this protective measure when they're baby or juvenile sharks. So to make them less palatable for a larger predator that might be trying to eat them. Um, and also, so their eyes I mentioned as well, they're, they're full of rods. Um, and this makes them really, uh, really capable of seeing at night which also makes sense because now we know that they're nocturnal. So, um, so what they're able to do is see really well in contrast. So if something is like um, really clearly defined against something else, but not so much in detail. So they're seeing things that are highly contrasted from one another. And it's amazing to put yourself in the shoes of like an animal or in the shoes of this shark where I'm, I'm wondering like, okay, so, they're functioning it at night. And my original thoughts were thinking things like, okay, so they don't rely much on their eyes for feeding at nighttime. But then of course I was corrected by, by you know, other people's observations saying, no, like we've studied the eyes of a PJ and they actually have a lot of rods in there and they can actually see, see well at night and this makes them more efficient hunters at nighttime, so. Cool, that's awesome. We've got a really interesting question here from Kevin. Um, how can the analysis of shark movement affect future aquarium design? Oh, that's a wonderful question. So, uh, so sharks are moving in a lot of straight lines out in the open ocean. So, and some aquariums are built in ways that are are just rectangles or squares, or they have sharp edges and things like that. And some of them I know are, are now built in like a circular fashion. So you really have to think about interrupting the shark's movement in some places to make it change direction. Because if a shark is swimming too much in one pattern of direction over and over again, um, that can affect their, their uh, structure of their spine and, and their body. So you want to make sure that there's diversity in their movements. Um, and one thing we saw, for example, was a lot of vertical swimming behavior um, when a shark was in, when a, in an aquarium environment. And we saw this, interestingly enough, in, in sharks that were in their migrational phase. So they were getting ready to migrate. And it was, it was kind of like that response you see from from birds where they put them in a funnel and then when their migration season comes along they they hop up more often on that funnel and the funnel has this like um this charcoal or like stuff on it where you can see the, sh the bird is jumping up more to the south so it wants to go to the south so you know we're wondering if um if sharks are displaying some of these uh migratory tendencies as well that's super cool um What's a PJ shark's skin texture? Oh, yes. So, uh, like sandpaper and slimy. <laughs> so, yeah, they have this like mucous membrane around them, around their body. And if you're wearing a wetsuit and you're catching PJs, that's going to show up on your wetsuit. 
And unfortunately, you're going to have a very high turnover of wetsuits as well because <laughs> the sharks are like rubbing against your wetsuit and your skin. And, um, and you're, it's, it's like, you know, just rubbing away at the fabric like that. But this mucous membrane is really, really good for the sharks because it protects them from infection and things like that, which is why we have to be really careful when we're tagging them. Um, because we don't want to interrupt that membrane and we want to make sure their skin stays healthy. Um, they do have sensitive skin. And, and yeah, otherwise just like kind of hard and, and sandpapery because of those dermal denticles um, that, are, that are on their skin. And if you zoom in, highly encourage everyone to Google this, you zoom in and you look at those dermal denticles, they're just like perfect little like, like star shapes, like all lined up next to each other. And this makes some sharks really efficient at swimming and really hydrodynamic. And we've actually copied um, the evolutionary design of, of shark skin and turned it into like, you know, swimming clothes and stuff and, and made swimmers be able to swim faster. That's so cool. Shark skin is super, super awesome. Um, <laughs> Cadence, age six, would like to know, how do sharks hear? Uh-oh, we lost Eric. Oh, well. But it's okay. I mean, let me see if she'll come back. You can answer. Okay. Uh, Should I, okay. Oh, she's back. Oh, good. There she is. Okay, great. <laughs> All good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, how do sharks hear? So, uh, sound is basically vibration. And underwater, um, it's, it's a lot denser than in the air. So sound travels really, really fast. And this is an amazing experience if you're scuba diving for the first time or something like that, where you're underwater and you hear a noise or your, your instructor or someone else will like shake a little um, shaker to try and get your attention. And you don't know where the sound is coming from because sound travels so quickly in the water that we don't have time for it to go from left ear to right ear. So you kind of have to like look around you and, and get your bearings of, of where that sound is coming from. But sharks, sharks uh, hear in the, in the same way. They sense vibration basically. And a really cool study done by our, our lab, um, Katerina Vilapuka, she recently um, graduated and she tested um, the shark's response, juvenile PJ shark's response to jazz music. And so she, <laughs> so she played um, jazz music in, in a one corner of the tank and the sharks learned to associate this, this music with a food reward. So they were able to make that association. Did they associate it with any music or specifically jazz? So they could tell the difference between jazz music and then another tone that she was, she was playing. That's and, awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. I love like things that sound weird but are actually more interesting the deeper you get into it. That's really fun. Um, the next question is, where do PJ Sharks get their name from? Yeah, so there's actually a Port Jackson in Australia, and um, and they're seen in that in that coastal bay, like many of Australia's coastal harbors and bays, and that's where they got their name from, from that Port Jackson. Yeah, it is a unique name. Yeah, um, Maddie would like to know: Do you have any advice for fellow graduate students that look are looking to do shark research? Yeah, so this. I think it's, it's a similar track you want to follow um, when you're just looking to get into research in general. So, you know, the most basic things like emailing the professors and the grad students and labs and like following them on Twitter and following their websites and going to their websites and, and seeing exactly what they're doing um, and, you know, reading their papers also. So like, uh, peer-reviewed or like academic publications may seem daunting at first, but if you, if you sit down and, and read into it and take, take a few minutes, you can get a lot out of those, those seemingly dense um, scholarly articles. And you can, you can email them, write them, and people are really busy, you know, professors are really busy. Sometimes they may not respond. So maybe the best thing to do is just keep trying over and over again. 
and um, and and really get in there, try and get FaceTime and and volunteer with the labs that you're interested in working with. Yeah, being persistent is important because sometimes people aren't ignoring you because they don't like you. They're ignoring you because they forgot to respond <laughs> and yeah. they just need a nudge. I know I'm guilty of that too. Um, the next question, um, you mentioned predators. What eats PJ sharks? Super good question. So that, that is actually a funny story because PJ sharks seem to be really unpalatable for everyone. <laughs> and <laughs> that seems to be the case for other larger animals and sharks and also for humans as well. So, um, you know, they, it doesn't, not, not as of now, we don't think anything is really eating them on a consistent basis, at least not the adults. So um, there was uh, some underwater camera study that we did with that, where we put some video recorders underwater and, and actually put in some, some fish in one location and, um, and then another stimulus in another location. And it seems like, um, yeah, nothing is really going after these, these poor Jackson sharks. That's very convenient for them. They look kind of like bony, like not, I mean, not bony because they they have cartilage, but like structure -y, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like I would not want to bite into that. Yeah, like you can see the eye, eyebrow type ridges and like yeah. other ridges, like it's the opposite of a, of a tasty soft squid. So they, Everybody likes to eat squid. They're the easiest <laughs> possible thing to eat. So it's like <laughs> two opposite ends of the spectrum, like Port Jackson Stark, real pain in the butt to eat, squid, so easy, couldn't be easier. Yeah. So, I know what my choice would be. Yeah, same. Um, <laughs> Hannah would like to know, how many teeth do they have? Oh, that's a super good question. And I have never counted the teeth inside the mouth of a poor Jackson shark, but that's the first thing I'm going to do after this. But <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I have a couple cool pictures and stuff here. So a lot of sharks, and the sharks you're probably picturing, have teeth like this, like, you know, layers of like spiny serrated teeth like that and these like triangular like things going on. And uh, that's what you think of when you think of shark teeth. But a lot of sharks are benthic and smaller like the PJ sharks, and they actually have teeth like this. So this is the front of the mouth here, and, um, and these are like little spiky teeth. And this is the top of the mouth there, and this is the back. So these ones are actually like crushing plates. They actually work together to crush up the hard food. And you can see what it looks like on, a, on another shark here. But yeah, these tiny spiky teeth in the front and then the crushing plates in the back. And you can see the sharks, like how they use them when you actually see them feeding. Um, but it's, uh, I can show you a, a short video of that actually, but they're, they're crushing up um, the prey the the squid or the clam or the mussel or something like that and then they're like pulling it into their system and they're excreting a lot of the hard things that they don't want through their gills so it's a very messy process but it's it's cool to watch and uh i can share my screen with you now to show you a short video of that that, that sounds cool yeah <laughs> So I'll let Aaron, there you go. Oh, they, at, th at this point, we've already explained, so. Oh, good. Okay, good. Um, let's see, share this one. Okay. taking a minute to show up. Oh, there it is. Okay. So you can see this, this female shark at the zoo. She's got a pink tail flag on her tail and she's chewing away on a, on a piece of squid there. What do you know? Chewing. Look at that stuff. Just coming out of her gills. Yeah. And then another shark just starts resting on top of her. Random things happen in there, but you can see that really small movement she makes when she's chewing on that on that small piece of squid, and um, and that's the movement we're trying to capture with the tags, which is a super fine scale movement if you think about it. That um, yep, 
that movement is um, is really, really quick and small. And we have the tag on the dorsal fin of that shark and it's measuring at 10 times per second. So you're really just trying to catch that one or two seconds of, of chewing behavior, um, which is a challenge. So. Awesome. Um, that sounds so cool. So uh, we've got one question. What college did you go to and how was it? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went to uh, Boston University, like Sarah, and um, I, I loved it there. I thought it was an amazing experience and it really, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do in the beginning. Um, a, lo a lot of people I know and myself included, I wanted to be a veterinarian before I went into other fields like animal behavior and marine biology. Um, and I was studying toward that. And uh, Boston University had great classes on animal behavior, practical labs, and um, I took an ornithology class and all these different areas. And, um, and then after that, I now, for my master's and for the PhD, I'm at Macquarie University here in Sydney. And, um, and I'm at the fish lab, basically. So the biological uh, sciences department is is um, really just kind of inviting and wonderful. And you wanna, you wanna feel that sense of community, I think, when you go somewhere. So if you're looking for somewhere to go, um, that's something to look for. Awesome. So we try to keep these to about 45 minutes and we've already gone over because I wanted to hear more about sharks. Uh, <laughs> and so we've got two final questions that we ask everybody. The first is, what's something that you wish everybody in the world knew about your area of expertise? And then the other question is, what is one thing that you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? It can be as silly or significant as you'd like. Oh, okay. Um, I think that about about the sharks it would be awesome if everybody took away that the that sharks have personalities um, they're different they're unique and to scientists this is known as individual variation but to to you know everybody else and to scientists as well it's known as just animal personality and this can be boldness shyness it can be um, level of activity and there are people who are studying populations, but it's equally as important to study individuals and the individual variations between what makes up a population. So it's, um, if you start thinking about sharks in, in different ways, uh, like, like they're not, not easy to kind of identify with. They don't have facial expressions, they don't have emotions, but if you, if you realize like, okay, so these are individual animals, they have personalities, they, they behave differently, then maybe that can help break down some of the misconceptions about them. Um, and the, the second question, the general thing about anything to know, um, I think, I think um, insects are amazing and they don't get enough credit. I think and you're right. They, <laughs> And I, they make up a huge amount of, of just like the mass of this planet and they perform really, really important jobs. Like their food, they're breaking down stuff, they're pollinating, like most of the food we eat, it's, it's incredible, like all the work and all the things they're doing. And people also, I have a soft spot for insects because people also have this misconception about them too. And they think, oh no, they're gross, like kill it, I don't like it. And we have this like gut instinct kind of to not like them. But in fact, like they're super important and they're so cool, you know, it's like, it's like aliens on our own planet and they're just amazing with what they can do. And there's, there's so many ways you can like make your house or your garden insect friendly, you know, so we can support the, the lives of like honeybees and other animals that are really losing their abundance in the outside world. Like they're decreasing in, in large numbers, unfortunately. So, so yeah, let, let, you know, put the caps on and, and um, I try to do that as well. I was a convert, you know, um, a professor at our university was like, talking about insects and I was like oh my gosh I've never thought about it this way and I was a total convert about insects after that so I have only I, I first of all could not co-sign anything anymore than this this is such a good point I only <laughs> recently started appreciating insects because I don't have a good answer for what I think I, I've been like following people on Twitter who post these macro images of like super zoomed in insects and I'm like they're gorgeous and I just like haven't 
sufficiently appreciated them. And they're, the, another thing that I really like about them is that almost anybody can find insects where they live. Like, you don't have to fly to Belize or Hawaii or Australia to see these animals. They're everywhere. And um, just the ones in your house you might not like, but go into the woods for five minutes, you're going to see an insect. Um, and it's probably going to be cooler than you had anticipated. So could not agree. Exactly. Exactly. I will, I'll send you um, from our university. Lizzie Lowe is like the champion for insects. So I'll send you her details. That's awesome. So where can we find you online? Uh, I'm online on Twitter at uh, JP Kadar. It's funny, my initials are JP and I study PJs, so it's great. And, um, and then on Instagram, I'm JP Kadar as well. And I'm usually, you know, talking about the PJs and talking about, um, you know, diversity in STEM and things like that. Fantastic. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. This was really cool and fun and also just good to see you again. Um, and uh, yeah, and Erin, thanks for signing for us as always. Um, other information for the audience. Uh, Friday, we're talking about uh, cleaning up toxic places um, that have been contaminated usually by industrial nastiness um, and how we can approach that. Um, all of the other information for subsequent sessions can be found at skypeascientist.com. If you click the live stream link, you'll see everything that we're up to over the next month. Um, and then, so, then some a little bit. Um, you can support our program at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or uh, make one-time donations via uh, paypal.me slash Skype a scientist. Another cool thing that we're doing is trivia just for adults. This is an adult program for um, tomorrow night. We're doing it at 4 p.m. Eastern because our co-host tomorrow is living in Germany. And so uh, we want Europe and the UK to be able to, to attend too. Um, but we do that every single Thursday night, typically at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so if this time works for you, that's great. Um, the, they're for scientists and non-scientists. You do not need to be a scientist to have fun. It's five bucks to play and it supports our program. Um, that's all I've got for you. Thank you again, Juliana and Erin, for being here today. Uh, Thank you so much. That yeah. was really fun. <laughs> okay, bye everybody. Bye.